So let's stand as we read God's Word. So if you haven't guessed, uh, we're reading about the prodigal son. <laughs> Luke 15, 11 to 24. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property on reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country, who sent him into the field to feed pigs. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs, pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. You may be seated. Today, as we talk about the, the prodigal son, it is one of the parables that Jesus taught. And it's one of three parables that he taught in sequence. It's the third one in sequence, where he's talking about things that have been lost and are very important to people. The, the first one is about sheep. If he lost a sheep, he would leave the 99 and go find the one. The second one is about a lost coin, that if a woman lost a coin, she would sweep the house and, look, and keep looking until she found it. When she found it, she would call her friends and they would celebrate. And the third is about a son. So the story, we need to really look into the story and see what happens. Uh, this, this young man, the younger brother, he heads out on his own. And, and I love the little cartoon because... He was like, woohoo, free at last, right? I'm no, under, no longer under dad's authority. I'm my own man. I can make my own decisions. I can go where I want to go, and I can go to bed when I want to go to bed, and I can get up when I want to get up, and I can eat what I want, and I can drink what I want, and I can sleep when I want, or not. I can make my own decisions. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. You know, we live under that delusion, right? When you're that young age, you think, wow, the day I turn 18, boy, things are going to be different around here. But yeah, you're probably going to have more responsibility. But anyway, to him, in his vision as he leaves, life is a party. Life is now my party. Uh, this is all going to be about me. Money is no object, no object. Friends are in abundance. And suddenly we realize that there is an end to the cash. And the party is over. And the friends are all gone, just like the money. And I can't find a job. And I'm just fighting to survive. You know, when you look at the food that the pigs are eating and it makes your mouth water, <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. You start thinking about home. And that's what happens to the, this young guy. He starts thinking about home. There are, you know, and his thoughts are, there's always a lot 
lots to eat at home. Even the servants have lots to eat. People are genuine at home, and they love me, and not for my wallet. And I'd be better off going home and working for my dad than where I am right now. I had a, this sermon came out of a conversation that I had with a parent. And the parent said, sometimes parents must make the tough decisions of not standing in their way. That's a tough decision to make. There are lessons to be learned by this young, arrogant boy. One of the saddest points of the story to me is the fact that the son really doesn't know the father and the father's heart until he hits bottom. And he, and, 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 and he starts rehearsing this big, long speech, right? Like what, and, and he practice it, practices it. Sorry, I'm having a hard time talking today. He starts practicing it and practices it the whole way home, right? Boo. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. That's the big speech. And I wonder how many times he worked that over in his head on the way home. I wonder if the son truly thought he was going to have to say all this to his dad. I wonder if he thought it would go down the way he had planned it. Because we can already see what a great planner he is, right? John Shulman would say, I had both feet firmly planted in midair. The reality of the situation is the son is not in charge of the father's feelings. And the father will react the way the father chooses to react. The father will accept the son back, or he won't. And it will not be on the son's terms, but on the father's. So we need to look at the father's reaction. So it says in verse 20, And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, now we know that the father had some money. The father had some status. The father was wealthy. People in that situation, they didn't run. And they didn't come to you. You went to them. Well, the world, and, and I just, you know how I keep saying I'm a, I'm a person, I, I can kind of vision the story, and this is what I visioned. As the world went around and around and around, no matter what the father was doing, he spent a lot of time searching the horizon. With a sad, wanting look in his eyes. Because he said, my son was dead. And when he sees him, and he's still a long ways off, dignity be damned. My son approaches, so I will run if I want to. And I will go to him if I want to. And I will kiss him, even if he stinks like pigs. No offense, Andy, uh, Jeff, like, I know you raised pigs for a lot of years, but... And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So the, the son tries, he tries to get this big speech that he has rehearsed over and over and over again. He tries to get it out. But the father's love overrules. And the father cuts in. He doesn't get to finish it. He says, I, have, I am not worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, quickly bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, which 
that ring on his hand establishes him back at his same standing in the family. He is my son. And shoes on his feet. It's like the father is not even listening to the son. And this big speech that he has spent maybe days rehearsing. You know, the son's over here, Father, I'm not running. And he's like, hey, go get the, kill the calf and bring the clothes and get the ring and get the shoes and start the band. The father's love won't allow him to make the son a disobedient slave. It will not allow him to do that. The father's love reinstates him to the position of son. And I know that this story may appear to be about a son far away a long time ago that has nothing to do with us. Well, it's not really a story. It's a parable. It's a lesson that Jesus is trying to teach us with. And it is told to his followers and it is written down and it is meant for us to learn. Many different people are portrayed in this story, this parable. And I want to look at some of them. The first one I want to look at is the father. Because the father represents God. The characteristics of this man that we love, his compassion, his love for his son, his willingness to forgive, his heart that rejoices at the return of his child, these are godly characteristics. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach us. This is how my father feels about you. This is how my father feels about everybody. The second person I want to look at is the son. But who is the son? Who is the disobedient? Who wants to have control? Yeah, all the time. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's you. Maybe we have walked away and done stuff that we believe is unforgivable. Maybe we fear God's wrath. But let me tell you, God is waiting, and he's watching the horizon for you. There is absolutely nothing you can do that will make God love you more. And there is absolutely nothing you have done that makes God love you less. God just loves you. It compels him, it drives him, it causes him to run towards you, no matter who you are. The day that you did the worst thing that you've ever done in your life, the thing that you think nobody saw and you got away with, God saw it, and he loves you still. Because God is love. And believe me, if we would just turn back to God, He will see us when we're still a long way off. And He will run and He will meet us. His desire is to forgive us. He wants to wrap His arms around us and He wants to kiss your whole face. He wants so desperately to reinstate you into the family. There's a character that I didn't read about, that we didn't really talk about, but that's the older brother. And all he seems to want to do is whine and complain about how faithful he has been. I'm going to read it. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard the music and dancing. And he called 
one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. And you know what? That is an actual fact. Because the first son, the youngest son, has received his half of the inheritance. So all that the father has now is his. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this is your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. We sang Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And in this parable, the son sees, the young son. So I hope, I really, really hope that the older brother doesn't represent the church. I really, really hope that we are able to see the joy for the one who returns to the Father. I hope we're in the party. I hope we're not the people who are unable to see past themselves and rejoice. When the one who is lost returns, when the one who is lost comes walking in the door, when the one the Father longs to see appears on the horizon, I hope the church would be ecstatic and overwhelmed with joy and rejoice and run with the Father. So who are you in this story? Who are we in this story? If you find yourself separated from God, will you just please return to Him? Will you allow His forgiveness in? Will you be found? Will you be alive in Him? Please, don't let fear or pride dictate. Let God's love decide. Verse 24, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. This could be you. Let's stand. Dear Lord, I thank you for this parable that shows us no matter what, you have searched the horizons for us. You have waited patiently for us. You long for us to be once again back in your embrace. Lord, may we as a church celebrate with you each and every person who walks through these doors, but more importantly, each and every person who comes to you in faith and says, Father, I'm home. Bless us as we go. Bless the food to our bodies that we will eat and bless the hands that prepared it and each and every conversation that happens around the table. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Have a great week. And stick around for vittles.